Oh, thank you. It's such a beautiful day. I'm telling you, I was like, Gary and I set out for lunch and I said, I have got to do this from out here today. I got to it's, go inside. <laughs> it's beautiful. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Dana Simpler. She is an internal medicine doctor, a plant-based internal medicine doctor in private practice in Baltimore, and I know you're going to love her. She's also a co-producer of a wonderful annual event when we can have in-person events, the Eat Well, Stay Well immersion that I've had the privilege of speaking at many times now with luminaries like Dr. Esselstyn. So please welcome to the show, Dr. Simpler. How are you doing? Hi there, everybody. Glad you're all joining us. Yeah. So you're an actual, you've been working even through the pandemic, right? Yes, I never stopped. And I've been working from my office, but I would be like back in my office doing telemedicine. I had to learn over a weekend how to go from inpatient, I mean, in office visits to telemedicine. It's a little bit bumpy at times, but it's, uh, it's worked out really, really well for this pandemic. That's fantastic. And you know, I, I think a lot of the doctors are actually enjoying the connection with the, the Zoom. I know I, I, I enjoy talking this way. Well, and then one of the nice things is you get to see the inside of people's houses. You know, there's a lot of people that I've known for years and years and, you know, see how do they decorate and their dog comes on screen and uh, you get to see if there's other people living in the house that you've heard about but never met. So, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. You know, I, I heard Dr. McDougall say recently that he's never going to go back to the in-person program because he's getting such tremendous results with doing it online because you can actually like look in somebody's pantry and see what snacks they have and things like that. <laughs> Oh, that, that's a funny story. And then I'll get started with what I wanted to talk to everybody about today. But I had this one um, patient who was not losing weight. And she goes, well, the problem is, you know, my father, he goes and he buys these uh, Krebs chocolates, which are a local chocolate in um, Maryland. And um, so I had her father on a Zoom call. Uh, and um, I said, um, so, you know, can you help your daughter out and not bring those chocolates into the house? He goes, oh, is that what she told you? Let me show you what my wife and daughter have stored in our pantry. And he took the computer over and there were two shelves of candies and cookies and this and that. And that. So, <laughs> caught them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's so great. You know, I've noticed, you know, there seems to be some people that say this pandemic has made them gain weight. They're calling it the COVID-19, but at least the people that I work with, they've all pretty much lost weight mainly because they can't go to restaurants. Right, right. I'm really, and that was one of the things I wanted to tell you, like what, the, the purpose of me being on today is I wanted to give the listeners kind of a feeling for what's happening on the ground. You know, when you watch television, everything is so politicized. We're either in the worst crisis since the plague or there's no crisis at all. And of course, the truth is uh, in between. So I want to give you all kind of a sense of that. Um, and to that point, I crunched the numbers today, looking again, what is the latest update in numbers? And we're over 8.2 million cases in this country with over 220,000 deaths. And when you do that as a percentage, that's a 2.7% death rate. And not that that's good, but it's not a 50% death rate. And so that's where we all do need to be careful. We need to make ourselves as healthy as possible. But the overwhelming majority of people are having much milder cases than you would that you would get just um, from from what you hear on the news at times. And that's been my experience. I've had um, dozens and dozens of patients have COVID. Only two of them ever even needed to go in the hospital and they didn't even end up on ventilators. They just were in and they gave them the hospitalized medicine and, um, and did quite well. They were out of the hospital in less than a week and are doing fine. Um, and that's, that's been my experience overall. And the other problem is when you just look at the raw numbers in terms of the death rate, a, lot, a large percentage, probably a good 35, 40% of the deaths in the United States happened in the first four to six weeks before anybody had any idea what to do. And as I'm sure you've heard, um, you know, everybody in the beginning was send us ventilators, send us ventilators. Every hospital wanted as many ventilators as they could get. Well, it turned out that that's the worst thing you can do with a COVID patient with COVID pneumonia is put them on a ventilator because what happens is you paralyze them, you put them on a ventilator, all of a sudden all these blood clots start forming and the people were dying from strokes and heart attacks and all these problems um, separate from the COVID. 
now that we know that, the treatment is much, much different. Now, when you go in the hospital, if you're hospitalized, just about every patient that's hospitalized ends up on full blood thinners because this clotting problem has turned out to be the, the, one of the more common reasons that people were dying from COVID. So they're, on, they're put on blood thinners. In the beginning, we were saying, don't give them steroids. Steroids are gonna uh, accelerate the course. Well, it turned out just the opposite was true. Steroids are beneficial. So now people get blood thinners, they get steroids, and the remdesivir, it just finally got approval that it clearly has been shown to reduce the number of days in the hospital, reduce the course of the um, COVID and the convalescent um, plasma. My patient who was hospitalized a couple weeks ago, she did get the convalescent plasma. The, that's the plasma from somebody who's recovered from COVID and they put that plasma into the patient with COVID, obviously automatically giving your body antibodies to the COVID virus. And so, um, so now people are doing so much better that, that I, we're just not seeing the death rates like we did in the beginning. Not that people aren't dying and not that you know, people shouldn't still be cautious, but it's not quite as horrendous as you would get the feeling on the news. Wow, I, that's fascinating what you said about ventilators because my biggest fear as somebody in their 60s that's an asthmatic is that I would end up on a ventilator and I used to be a respiratory therapist and that's not something I want ever. So so that act, so they got the treatment wrong at the beginning is what you're saying. They got the treatment wrong in the beginning, of course, because nobody knew what to do. And another interesting thing they're finding, so what they were doing in the beginning is they if, if the oxygen level dropped below 90 and below 90, that's when the doctors get concerned that, that you're gonna be so low at oxygen that you might start to suffocate. So if the people got below 90, they would put them on the ventilator right away, even if they weren't in a lot of distress. And there were many, many reports of people talking to their loved one going, okay, um, I gotta hang up now. They're gonna put me on the ventilator. Goodbye, love you, click. And then the person's on the ventilator and never wakes up. So um, what they do now, which is fascinating, and I, I had actually never even heard of that until this year, but maybe you've heard of it, AJ, if you were a respiratory therapist. Now what they do, instead of letting people stay on their back when they're short of breath and their oxygen is dropping, they turn them on their stomach. It's called proning. And when you prone somebody, it turns out their oxygen levels are coming up four, five, six points, taking them out of that danger zone. And, um, and they're doing fine. And they're also, if somebody's oxygen drops below 90, they're like, all right, well, if it's below 90, but you're not in distress, we're not gonna put you on a ventilator. So, so that has really, really helped a lot, not putting people on the ventilators. Do you actually see patients in the hospital? Are you a hospitalist too? No, 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 I just do outpatient, yeah. Yeah, okay. so, um, and I'm not physically seeing COVID patients in the office. When I see my COVID patients, they've gotten the diagnosis somewhere else and then I'm monitoring them um, by telemedicine. And, uh, and let me tell you um, what I'm telling my patients to do. So like I said, if you're inpatient, they put you on full blood thinners because of the problem with all the blood clotting, strokes and heart attacks that were occurring, that are occurring with um, COVID. But that's not really, um, th that also has a lot of downside when you put somebody on full blood thinners. So what I'm doing with my patients that are outpatients is I'm having them take an aspirin a day while they're home with their COVID, while they have COVID and for about two, three weeks after COVID while they're in their recovery, I have them take an aspirin. The, the 325, if they can get it, um, uh, the, the 81 milligram, if, if um, there's other, other problems. And there are some people who can't take aspirin. Um, so in, you know, if somebody's contraindicated from it, but, um, and if somebody's on some other kind of blood thinner, they certainly don't have to take aspirin. And so people will say, well, should I just start taking aspirin now, even though I haven't gotten COVID yet? And my answer to that is no, because there can be some complications to aspirin therapy, bleeding ulcers, other kinds of things. So um, I, I think it's best, but if you do get COVID, I think it's a good idea to take an aspirin. And um, the other things I have my patients take is vitamin D, 2000, vitamin C, 500, and zinc, 50. And uh, those, if you want to start taking those now and take them, you know, kind of pre preventatively, cautiously, 
those basically are, are safe supplements to be taking regularly if somebody wants to be taking some kind of preventative supplement. Wow, well, I'm actually allergic to aspirin, but the rest of the stuff now sounds like a great advice. The patients that you're seeing with COVID, are they more elderly? Are they, are they vegan? Are, do they have other comorbidities? So who are you seeing in your practice get COVID? Right. Well, it's a mix. And a lot of times I'm seeing whole families, like, cause I take care of a lot of whole families. I see like the, the 20 year old daughter and the 45 year old mother, because they had mother's day together and <laughs> some, somebody in the group had um, COVID. And so it's quite a mix, but the interesting thing is, like I was saying, people aren't necessarily getting that sick right now. So for example, I had a patient who went to a, um, uh, he went to a wedding shower for his um, daughter-in-law and which you can ask yourself, why is somebody having an in-person party like that to begin with? But anyway, they did. And he went and um, he's 79. So obviously the high age risk, diabetic, had bypass, cardiac bypass surgery a little over a year ago and 40 pounds overweight. He was sick for like a day and a half and then was fine. Uh, very, like a very mild case. Um, and then, um, you know, and then I'm seeing other people like the couple I had recently that ended up in the hospital, they, they were obese. So that would have been their risk factor for, um, for a hospitalization. But then, uh, and then a lot of other people, you know, it's just a real mix. But the, the thing that I wanted to make sure everybody understands, at least from what I'm seeing, is a lot of the spread is happening in family gatherings, people going to weddings, people going to events. So we've got a couple of big ones coming up. What's everybody going to do with their Thanksgiving and their Christmas? That's going to be a, a conversation that each family has to have. Wow. Well, you know, there's one of the things that's going on is a lot of mask shaming. You know, people don't like fat shaming, of course, but now, you know, even some of the doctors that I used to really admire in the plant-based world are basically shaming people that wear masks. And, you know, I remember when I had Dr. Gregor on the show, he's, he's pro mask, by the way, he said, just because somebody eats vegetables doesn't mean they're not an idiot. So we're, <laughs> we're, that's what he said. And he, you know, some people got pissed off at that, but where, where do you, you know, what, first of all, where do you stand on masks in general and, and why it, and if somebody chooses to obey the law and wear one, why should we be shamed for that? Oh, um, well, in Maryland, everybody wears masks. It, uh, so I, we're, we may not be experiencing that kind of mask shaming that maybe you're experiencing in other states. Um, with, that was a law pretty early on and pretty much everybody follows it. It's rare that you ever see somebody in a public place not wearing a mask. Um, but I think masks work. Uh, I was I was perturbed in the very beginning when some of the powers that be were the, the medical experts were saying that the, the masks weren't any good. And I was like, why are you saying that? Of course, masks are good. If, if masks aren't any good, why do surgeons all wear masks when they're doing operations? If masks are no good, do you want, you want to have an operation and have people breathing into your wound? Um, you know, which they don't, of course, everybody's wearing masks and gloves and gowns. And um, in, in the hospitals, we for as long as I can remember, anytime you have somebody that has an infection that you're trying to make sure doesn't get spread to people around the hospital, everybody wears masks and gloves. Um, so um, I, the only thing that made sense to me, like why they were saying that in the beginning is Number one, they didn't want people going out and hoarding masks when they didn't have enough for the, the hospital supplies. So that might have been a little bit of a motivation, not wanting people to start hoarding all the N95s when they needed them in the hospital. Um, and the other thing is, okay, yeah, maybe with the mask, maybe there's still a little particle might get in, but it takes a lot of viral particles for you to catch COVID. So one viral particle if it happened to sneak past your mask and get up your nose, is not going to cause COVID. You need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of viral particles in order to actually get infected with it. So um, a mask is going to protect you and it's going to protect you that, that the person talking to you isn't blowing COVID into your face. And that's pretty much the main way that COVID is being spread, is when people are sharing airspace and all, um, and the virus is, you know, you're just breathing in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of the viral particles, more so than the touching. 
not that we shouldn't be washing our hands and, and uh, being careful with our surfaces, of course we should, but that doesn't turn out, that hasn't turned out to be as much the way people catch COVID as it is spending time uh, with, with somebody with the virus and sharing their airspace. And um, if I can go on about that just a little bit more, um, on top of that, you don't get COVID from a walk by. So if you're out walking, not wearing a mask, and you walk by somebody who's not wearing a mask, and it's literally just a walk by, it's not enough time, it's not enough particles for you to catch COVID. So if you're out walking, there's really not a lot of rationale for somebody wearing masks. Now, I, there's a trail near me that they do require people to wear masks if you're walking by people. So a lot of people, you know, they keep their masks down and they just put it up when they walk by and put it back down. Not a real lot of science behind that, but you know, you try to respect how people are feeling as well. Um, but yeah, the masks are very effective. Yeah. Uh, Julie says, people can't breathe. I'm a hairstylist. You wear one for 10 hours straight. I switch to a plastic shield. So is that as effective as a mask? I've been seeing a lot of people at the, when I went for physical therapy for my rotator cuff, they were wearing masks and shields actually. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that they're as effective. I mean, when you do the mask and the shield, the shield is then protecting your eyes. The mask is covering your nose and mouth. The problem with the shield is your air might hit the the, mat, the shield and it just goes down and then just comes right back up. So, um, so I, I don't think that they're as effective. Yeah. So there's a question from Diane. What do you think if there's a COVID vaccine, will it be effective? Should we take it? You know, cause it's funny because anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers, they often go together, <laughs> at least in the, at least in the vegan world, you know, if you're against right. one, you're against the other. Well, and a lot of people are just against vaccines in general. I, I'll tell you, I'm going to take it. And, um, so, and the reason is because even though I'm telling you, it's the, the, the chance of dying from COVID isn't that likely, you know, you're, you're much more likely to survive it than to die from it. But nonetheless, the risk of the vaccine is going to be far lower than the risk of the COVID. So anytime you have a vaccine and you start, you know, you take it out of the 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 study, and now you're distributing it to millions of people, that we're always going to find something. You know, there's always going to be an unexpected reaction with somebody. But on percentages, the chance of something going wrong with the vaccine is, is going to be this, and the chance of something going wrong with COVID is going to be this. So it's the balance. Right. Uh, M Miriam says, is it true that COVID can transmit from the eyes? Um. I don't, I don't see why it couldn't, although I'm, you know, mainly it, it has to get into droplet form. So I guess you'd have to rub your eye, shake somebody's hand and then have them rub their eye or something is I think maybe that's what she's thinking. I mean, I can, I would imagine it's, you know, it's in your body fluids, but, um, but the main thing is the air, it's the aerosolization. Uh, right. And there's actually an interesting concept going on that because most people, especially in Maryland, in our experience, most people are wearing masks. But, you know, if you're still out and about, you probably have come in contact with somebody who had COVID and didn't know they had it. So maybe you didn't get the full 10,000, 100,000 viral particles that it needs to get COVID, but maybe you got 40 or 50. And then maybe a week later, you got another 40 or 50. So there's a, a, a theory that perhaps people are getting many vaccinated from these mini exposures, it's called variolation. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and so that might also attribute to why we're not seeing as many people getting so sick. Maybe people have already gotten a tiny bit immune to it, even though if you tested their blood, they don't actually have full blown antibodies because they didn't have full blown COVID, but they maybe have sort of been micro vaccinated. Oh, and if I can bring up one more thing about the vaccination, sorry. Um, a lot of people are also worried. They think that because the, the vaccine is being done quickly, that that's the same thing as sloppy. And, um, oh, excuse me, I'll just cancel that. Um, uh, and I don't believe that to be the case. And the difference is typ typical vaccine development, what happens is a drug company has this much money and they do this much work and then they spend six months analyzing the work 
and they go to the FDA who sits on it another six months. And then they go to the next stage with that much money and, you know, go along like that. Well, as I'm sure everybody knows, if you watch the news, they have thrown billions of dollars at the drug companies to do these vaccines. So they're starting off with <laughs> this huge amount of money and they can, they can, you know, work around the clock. And um, they've also, um, worked with the FDA that if, if something hits a desk at the FDA, it's not sitting there for six months if it's related to the COVID vaccine. They're looking at it immediately. They're figuring out their approval process immediately if it's safe or not safe. So the reason that it's gone faster is because they've thrown so much money at it. And on top of that, this was a really brilliant thing. I don't know who thought of this, but this was a really, really brilliant thing. The government has already pre-purchased somewhere between 100 million and 300 million vials of vaccine that's under the process of being studied. And if it turns out that the vaccine doesn't work or doesn't end up getting approved, that'll all get thrown out. But if it does get approved, then we don't have to wait another six months, 10 months for them to manufacture. They're ready to go. And I know in the state of Maryland, they're already contacting us. And even though the vaccine, we don't have a, an available vaccine, they're getting a system in place and, you know, you sign up and, and tell us what you're going to need. And, and uh, if you want to be somebody who provides it in your office so that when that vaccine's ready, there is just no wasted time. Well, Sherry says our bodies were created to encounter and fight off virus and infections all the time. Masks decrease our ability to build and maintain immunities, and they also cause facial acne and infection, and my daughter's suffering terribly since she's required to wear one for hours in a hot kitchen. What say you to that? Um, well, I, I wouldn't disagree, except that that there are people that are dying from this particular virus. So, um, so <laughs> I don't know that it's really wise to say, you know, go send all the doctors and nurses into rooms with COVID patients with no masks. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And um, so, you know, um, I don't think that that's super logical that, that we should knowingly expose ourselves. Yeah, well, I agree with you, but you know, there's people, they have their opinions. So uh, let's see, Leanne says, should you take the vaccine if you have an autoimmune condition? Okay. Good, good uh, question. And let's hold that question because you said something earlier, AJ, that I meant to react to. You have history of asthma. Early on, asthma was on one of the predisposing condition lists. Asthma has actually been taken off of the list. It turns out that asthma, the, the whole reaction that happens with asthma, it does not happen with COVID. So, um, so thankfully, people with asthma do not need to be overly concerned. The people that need to be concerned are more people with COPD, where they already have limited lung function. And um, so any pneumonia would be hard on them. Um, but to the, um, what, what was her question? I'm sorry, I forgot it already. Um, the, the, the one about the mask that we, we were that, um, creating uh, uh, acne. No, it and... was after that. What was that after that? Sorry. Well, uh, should we take the uh, uh, vaccine if oh, we no, have auto an autoimmune condition? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So the so autoimmune. So they list that as an underlying condition, but what the truth is around that? It's not the autoimmune condition itself that is harmful. It's the um, it's all the medications that many people with autoimmune conditions are taking because they take these very strong biologic drugs that suppress your immune system because that's what autoimmune is is a your your own immune system attacking different parts of your body and so the people are treated with these drugs that basically suppress the immune system and so yes suppressing the immune system is an underlying problem. And that makes people at higher risk with COVID. Um, but the vac taking the vaccine, if you have autoimmune, really depends on if you're on a biologic. And if you are on one of the biologic drugs, then you have to discuss it with whatever doctor is giving it to you, whether it's your GI or rheumatologist or whatever doctor is giving it to you. Because they have to do special timing because the same thing, if you're taking heavy duty um, uh, immune suppressants, and you get a vaccine, guess what? 
your body doesn't get an immune reaction to it because you're taking medicine that's blocking immune reactions. So that there's a whole timing mechanism around that. So for example, if somebody is getting a Remicade or something uh, uh, once a month or whatever their schedule is, they would time it so you would get your vaccine a few days before you would get your next immune suppressive drug. Great. And people are asking if they should also take the pneumonia vaccine. Um, so it's a different kind of pneumonia. The pneumonia that people get uh, with COVID is literally called COVID pneumonia, and it is it is a viral pneumonia. the The pneumonia vaccine is a bacterial pneumonia. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt to take it, and potentially one could argue that, well, what if you get the viral pneumonia and this can happen and then somehow the bacterial pneumonia starts on top of the viral pneumonia that you would be in worse shape. So uh, you, you can definitely take the pneumonia vaccine, but it's not going to stop you from getting COVID pneumonia. Got it. And uh, Dina's worried, what well, will the vaccine have mercury and egg whites in it or eggs in it? Um, the new one, the one coming out, mm -hmm. I have no idea because and it's a multiple different companies and, um, we don't know even which one is going to get approved. So. Okay. And Stephen says, can you please comment on plexiglass partitions in dining and workplaces? It's, it's it seems like a good idea. I would think same idea. You know, you're trying to break down this uh, having in your breathing space, all the viral particles. So if they hit up against the plexiglass and they go up, hopefully they stay up, but you know, I guess it's possible they could go up and then come right down the other side of the wall. But, um, uh, but hopefully, I mean, it's not, I, not quite, in my opinion, it's not quite as effective as wearing a, a mask, which is protecting you more personally, um, but uh, a good idea. And I'll tell you a fun thing we're doing in my office to try to keep the foot traffic down is um, when people are coming in for their flu shot, they're, um, they, they call when they're in their car. Where my office is, it's easy for us to get out where people are parking. Um, they, they call the office and say, okay, I'm, I'm in the parking lot. And my secretary draws up the flu vaccine, goes out to their car and gives it to them in their car. So that way we really reduce the foot traffic of people coming in and out of the office. So... But, you know, I've heard many of the doctors on the show say people that are overweight or obese are particularly vulnerable. Is that true for all types of viruses or is this one special in that it, it does affect that population more? And I always wondered why. That's a good question. Uh, I haven't seen anybody answer that directly, but the, the thinking that it makes sense to me is that people with obesity also tend to have insulin resistance or diabetes. They also tend to have cardiovascular disease. So, and we know that those problems make you more prone to dying from COVID. Again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the blood clotting. So that's why when people go into the hospital now with COVID, they, especially if you're diabetic, if you're over 40, if you're overweight, if you've had any um, heart disease, they automatically put them on full blood thinners to prevent the heart attacks and strokes. So that would be one mechanism. The other mechanism is that when, you, when you're overweight, especially when you lay down, the, literally the weight of your chest can be hard for your lungs to breathe against. And so, um, so that could be another reason. That's the same way people get sleep apnea. So it may be along that, those lines as well. Any idea when it's going to be over? <laughs> ah, soon, please. <laughs> I, you know, I, I tend to believe Fauci probably better than any of the other ones. And so, um, I, you know, it, it's going to be over in stages because as soon as the vaccine hits, then we're going to vaccinate the healthcare workers, our vulnerable people. Um, so they'll all get vaccinated first. And that's important because now the people that are statistically more likely to die from COVID um, are gonna be vaccinated. And then, then eventually the entire population will. So I think some people will be free to move around the cabin a little sooner than others. <laughs> uh, can you get it again? Cause I've heard that some people are getting it again. Is that possible? Okay, so that's, I'm glad you asked that question because that's something that has been very frightening to a lot of people. So right now, the current belief is that if you get COVID, they think that you will have immunity anywhere from one to three years 
you know, it's still being studied, but that kind of is the projection right now that you'll have immunity for one to three years. But there have been occasional cases. There was um, one written up um, last week of somebody who clearly tested negative, I mean, clearly tested positive, then got well, tested negative, then got sick again and tested positive. And the, you know, they, they were very well documented um, that this was a, a reinfection. So it's not that it can't happen and whether there's maybe something like the, the strain is different, you know, just like the flu strains can be different and somehow that's how it happened. But, the, um, uh, but if you just look at our numbers, I mean, we have 8.2 million people in this country who we know for sure have had COVID. I'm sure there's a lot more that we don't know who've had it. And, and it's not like we're seeing a half a million people getting it a second time. So I, I would think that if it was gonna be a common occurrence, then you would see it happening and it's not. So it's a rare occurrence. Great. Uh, there's a question about schools from Anne. Can you comment on children attending school, elementary through college? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a really tough one. Um, I, I like the schools that are giving the families options. Like you, have, you can have the option of doing online learning or you have the option of going into the classroom because there's some kids that need to be in a classroom. You know, this sitting at home in front of a computer is they are not learning. It's not good for them socially. Um, uh, there's there's a, a lot of schools, they don't even require you if you're doing a Zoom class, they're not even requiring you to have your camera on. So you can turn it on and go back to sleep and nobody would know. <laughs> so um, so from that point of view, I think that it it is really important that we figure out how to get kids back into the classroom. Having said that, I'm seeing a lot of very creative ways that it's being done. I, I know a number of teachers and principals and um, they're, they're doing very careful cautious things. One of them, they've been trying to do all their classwork outside. They set up these big tents and they set up classrooms outside and they've been teaching outside pretty much since, um, since the beginning. Now that's going to have to end because Maryland gets cold. Um, so um, I, I've seen also other interesting things where instead of the kids going in the hallway and going to different classes, the teachers go to the different classrooms. So it's one group of kids stay in a classroom and then the teachers come in individually. So I think there's a lot of creative ways that, that it can be done. Um, I mean, we're in our office all day with masks on, you know, in the hospital, people are there all day with their masks on. So there's a lot of people working, you know, you go to the grocery store, the people in the grocery store are working with their masks on all day. So, um, and you're not hearing about huge outbreaks at among grocery store workers. Um, so, so I, I think that you know, is it going to be 100% safe? And that's the problem. You know, what if that one teacher gets sick? And what if that one teacher happens to have some condition, and then they pass away? Obviously, you don't want to put anybody in that kind of situation. So I, uh, I don't know if I'm really answering it. But I just I would like to, <laughs> I would like to see it work. <laughs> you know, I remember when I went to university, that was the year of the big earthquake in California, and the buildings were destroyed. And we had outside learning intents. And it was, you know, it was fine. Right. Yeah. But we were in California too. So it's, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't cold. Right. It's, you know, you know, the slaughterhouse workers, there's a lot of them getting it. Yes. Yes. I guess they stand so close together. And I, you know, when they showed you the pictures, they would always show you with them wearing their masks, but I always wondered if maybe they didn't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah but then, they, but they stand on, if you ever seen those pictures, I mean, they are standing right next to each other. There's yeah. Uh, yeah. Voracious Vegan says, do you think there'll be any part of the population that could be exempted from getting the vaccine or will, will, will everybody be forced to take it? I don't think any, I, I don't think any individual can be forced to take it unless you are in an occupation that requires it. So for example, hospital workers are required to take the flu vaccine or they're not allowed to come to work. And um, the, the only, um, the only way they cannot do it in years past, like if, if for the flu vaccine, is they would have that then have to agree to wear a mask for the entire flu season. Of course, now everybody's wearing masks anyway. So, um, but I think you know, there's no way that anybody can force anyone to take a vaccine. Now, but that, you know, but schools might. So it depends. You know, a school might require it, and then they'll have whatever their particular policy is around it. Nice, thank you. Jan says, have you seen any long-term effects from people after getting COVID? 
Yes. Yeah, so interesting. A lot of people are losing their sense of taste and smell when they get COVID. And it's, it's very pathognomonic, meaning that there's really not very many other things that do that. So when I talk to a patient who's sick and they tell me they're losing their sense of taste and smell, I go, you've got COVID with or without a test, you've got COVID. And so about 87% of those people will recover their sense of taste and smell, but about 13% don't. And that can be long-term. So what I'm doing now with my patients, if they lose their sense of taste and smell, is I'm actually having them use a steroid mouthwash that we normally use for uh, cancer patients that are taking chemotherapy and getting mouth sores. And I have them swish and spit. Same idea, trying to get the steroid to counteract the virus. And then um, I wasn't previously doing the steroid nasal spray, but there is a steroid nasal spray that's over the counter called a Flonase. And I just saw a patient yesterday for telemedicine who I gave her the mouthwash and she regained her sense of taste, but her sense of smells not come back. So I'm going to have her do that Flonase and hopefully that'll come back. That's one. And then also this kind of sense of fatigue. Some people are reporting this kind of like sense of, of, of uh, fatigue, maybe even a little brain fog. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing. Yes, loss of sense, loss of the sense of smell and taste would be terrible for a chef. <laughs> terrible for a chef. Yeah, I remember my when my grandfather was elderly and had Parkinson's and cancer, he lost both and he just had no interest in eating. When he couldn't taste and smell, it was like there was, there was no interest in food anymore. Right, right. And that's actually one of the big problems with COVID. And when I'm um, talking to my patients who are home with their COVID is I tell them, you know, even if the food tastes terrible, you have to eat, you have to drink, because one of the reasons people end up hospitalized is they get dehydrated, they get malnourished because they won't eat or drink for three or four or five days in a row. And then they end up hospitalized with all these electrolyte problems. So, so that's one thing. If you do, any of you listening, if you do get COVID, make sure you continue to eat and drink, stay hydrated. Yeah. Well, Stephanie says, are the tests to see if you have the antibodies accurate and are they widely available? They're widely available, very easy to get. You can get it any, just like if you were gonna get a cholesterol test, it's the same kind of like a little blood draw at the lab. They're, at least in Maryland, they're not being rationed at all. Um, if you wanna get it, you can get a, a request through your doctor's office or uh, in Maryland anyway, a lot of the urgent care centers, you can schedule to go in to get the antibody test. So th that's there. Um, now, are they accurate? Hard to know, <laughs> hard to know, because I've seen people who clearly had COVID and this was early on when we, we were rationing the tests and, uh, but clearly they had COVID and um, then they go to do the antibody test and their antibody test is negative. It's like, how can that be? You absolutely had it. So I, I don't know. I, I think with all of the tests, it's, a, it's, it's hard to know because they all had to be designed and created in such a hurry and then they're being mass produced in such a hurry that you know I'm not not sure okay Jessica says has the symptom of COVID toes remained an indicator of positive COVID tests and I'm not actually sure what that is um okay I've heard of, I don't know a lot about it I think the COVID toes is like when the toes start to change colors not a prominent symptom that I'm seeing how come nobody's talking about where the pandemic came from? Hello. Right, right. Well, I think some people are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, the wet markets. So, or just eating animals, you know, not so good. In your opinion, how can we protect ourselves of COVID and all kinds of pandemics and other lifestyle diseases? What do you right. think we, we can do? That's absolutely something I wanted to make sure we talked about. So um, now is the time to make yourself the healthiest you can be for if you get COVID or anything else. Uh, for example, I had a friend who prior to the pandemic had never run. He did other kinds of exercise, but he had never run. And he decided in the beginning of the pandemic that he was gonna start exercising with running. And at first he could maybe run a hundred feet, then he would walk and run a hundred feet, then he walked. Well, after five months, he can, he can now run a 10K straight without stopping. So, you know, that, so that's a, a beautiful thing a lot of people are doing. They're, they're taking this time to really pay attention to what they're eating, 
pay attention to their exercise, make sure they're getting rest. Um, you know, obviously we know that lots of fruits and vegetables are really good for your immune system. So making sure you're having plenty of your salads and your smoothies and all of that, um, th those are really key. Yeah, have, have you noticed any improvement in your health since going plant-based? Um, kind of. Now, the, the one thing is I, I went plant-based 11 years ago and I wasn't sick at the time and I've not been sick since. Um, the, the one thing I did notice is um, when I first went plant-based, I would wake up in the morning, maybe a tiny bit stiff, a little, a little stiff getting out of bed. And I did notice that once I went plant-based, I just jump out of bed in the morning. But I think you know, like I play tennis and I run like crazy around the tennis court and I, I come off of the court and I go, I, I go, I, I can't believe at my age that I can, that I can do all that and just have no problem. Um, so um, yeah, the aches and pains are good, but, but my story is kind of, when we tell my vegan story, it's kind of a fun story. Oh, I'd love to hear it. So, um, so uh, I, I like to listen to books on tape because I have about a 35 minute commute each way to my office. And so uh, on Audible, the China study popped up as something you might be interested in reading. I'm like, okay. And I had heard, you know, 30 years ago that people with heart disease did better with a plant-based diet. But I had never heard until I read the China study that cancer was affected by diet as much as they said, and as uh, much as it is and the autoimmune diseases and, and all, the, all the other conditions that, um, that the plant-based diet is beneficial for. So um, I went plant-based, it was a little slow at first because I didn't have my husband on board. And then we had a uh, hurricane warning in Maryland and everybody was forced to stay home. And I had, at that point, I had ordered um, John, the Dr. McDougall, uh, the DVDs that he had from his weekend conferences. And I'd seen Esselstyn's video on Make Yourself Heart Attack Proof. And my husband, unfortunately, has a very bad family history for heart disease. Father died at 44 of a heart attack, mother's first heart attack at 58. Brother, had, who has now since passed on, started with heart disease when he was in his early 50s. And, um, and so we've always been concerned about his heart. So I was like, honey, can you please watch this video? Please watch this video. We've got all this time on our hands. We're locked in here. And he, and he was like, okay, because I'd been nagging him so much. So he, I put the DVD, the DVD in and it's, it's about, it takes about an hour for people have seen it. So he's watching it. I'm watching him watch it. He's not saying a word. I'm not saying a word. The video's over. He turns over to me and he goes, okay, I'm vegan. <laughs> So then it got a lot easier for me because now, you know, I have an ally in the house. And so it was um, much easier for us to, to be vegan because we're vegan together. <laughs> that's so great. And I think your kids are too. I mean, you have a daughter that's in medical school, right? Yes. Well, she's actually a doctor at Cedar sinai She's almost finished with her internal medicine training. She's, she's graduated from medical school and she finishes in June. Um, yeah, she's, she's very plant-based. The other two are cooperative. They, what they do is like, like what we said with the kids early on, because when we went plant-based, they were already in the process of college and moving out of the house and everything. So what we did, I asked them, I said, I, I really want you to watch this Esselstyn video. I'm not saying you have to do this, but I want you to understand why we're doing this. And I don't want you to undermine us um, because, you know, that's the problem. As many people know, a lot of people try to undermine you. So they watched it and, um, and they got, you know, my daughter got totally on board. And then the other two are kind of like 50, 50, but they're completely cooperative in our home. You know, whatever I'm cooking, they're happy to eat. That's fantastic. Well, you sound like you'd be a great doctor. Elspeth, who's watching says you're her doctor. She's so yeah. lucky. She's, she's adorable. <laughs> well, she's more than adorable. She's my stylist. If you notice that I'm looking better on these shows, it's because she bought me a whole wardrobe of shirts so that I don't have to just wear t-shirts all the time. So yeah. yeah. Well now I know that you don't take any new patients right now, or at least I should say there's a waiting list, but the ones you have are, they, do they have to be plant-based? So I've been in practice for over 30 years and I've been plant-based for about 10. So I didn't kick anybody out of the practice who I've had from prior, but new patients, I made a decision maybe like 
five or six years ago that any new patient needed to be plant-based because I've spent so much time now studying it, uh, going to all the plant-based conferences that they have for the doctors, watching videos, reading the books. And so um, I want to work with people who want a doctor that is trying to do that for them. And it's very refreshing for them because they go to a doctor who doesn't say, where do you get your protein? And, uh, you know, a, a little bit of meat's okay for you. You know, just all, all the things that you hear from the different doctors. So, um, so I, I really enjoy it. And, and it's, and it is really a relief for the patient that they don't have to explain their diet. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of conferences, you actually produce one of your own. That's how we met. Yes, yes. So Sharon and I do the Eat Well, Stay Well every year. And it, it was scheduled this year. We had such a great conference planned. It was going to be the Sure's Eyes were going to come and speak. At, and the whole thing was going to be revolving around Alzheimer's. And um, it was scheduled in September. But obviously, of course, we canceled it early on. It was clear that wasn't going to be able to happen. And we thought a little bit about trying to do a, a, a virtual meeting. But feel a little technologically challenged to do that. So I think at this point, we're just going to wait till we can do an in-person one again. But those are in Maryland. They're, they're a lot of fun. We usually get anywhere from like, you know, three to 400 people and get some great speakers. We've had Dr. Furman. We've had, um, uh, well, AJ, you've done a great job for us many times. We've had uh, Dr. Esselstyn. Esselstyn came. Yep. That was yeah. really fun. Yeah. They're really fun. Kit says, I am highly immunosuppressive and I got a jury summons in Los Angeles. My doctor refused to sign my jury summons because he was concerned about liability. Any advice? I mean, I, I get another doctor because I, I mean, they don't, why would they have liability if they're telling the truth? I don't, I don't think that there's liability. I mean, ba basically the liability is kind of the other way, you know, like what if she goes and gets, you know, he doesn't provide that or she doesn't provide that. And, um, she goes and gets COVID and gets really sick from it. You know, uh, I would think the liability is the other way. Now, if somebody's got um, immunosuppression, but I mean, I don't know what her exact medical problem is. So maybe there, maybe there's more to that story. Right. So, what's your, what's your best piece of advice for people to get healthy and stay healthy, whether it's COVID or the flu or just any of these really preventable lifestyle diseases like you know diabetes and heart disease? Right. Right. The important factors, number one, if you're not thin, get thin, because being overweight increases your risk for everything. Um, if, you, um, uh, if you're not eating a plant-based diet, try to become as close to plant-based as you can. You know, if you, if you can't get yourself to be 100%, even being 80 or 90%, I know some people don't like that little permission because they feel like people are gonna cheat too much if they do that, but but there's pretty good evidence that people that are near vegan get many of the same health benefits as people that are purely vegan. So there is a dose related effect for eating animal products in your diet. Um, exercise is very important. Um, trying to get 180 minutes of exercise a week, more if you if you can. Sleeping well, you know, getting good sleep um, and stress. You know, just really really don't let yourself be tense all the time. If you have issues that, you know, past traumas in your life that, that you're still holding on to that pain, see if you can find some way to release that, whether it's working with a counselor, working with meditation, working with yoga, something to teach your body to relax. Okay. Well, Ruth, who's watching live says, but the doctors where she are tells her to cut down on carbs. I, that, that's what drives me crazy. That is all I eat. And I get, get thinner. And I mean, I eat boatloads of potatoes, rice, and yet I keep getting thinner. You know, I, it's like now I'm like, this is unbelievable that people still think that carbs make you fat. Right, so there's good carbs and bad carbs. And um, the, so for example, there's studies showing that drinking one can of soda a day, which obviously is just pure sugar, increases diabetes by a, a certain percentage, but having one serving of beans which is a complex carbohydrate, lowers the risk of diabetes by a certain percentage. So they're both carbs, but they're not the same. So you can't compare, um, you know, an apple to uh, M&Ms. So, so it's the unprocessed carbs that are safe for you. 
The reason some people like the low carb diet though, is it puts their body into a ketotic state, ketosis. And I do have some patients that, that have a much easier time losing weight when they do that kind of that go into ketosis. Yeah, but then what are they doing to their microbiome? I just interviewed like 40 GI doctors saying that that diet is horrible for the planet health, for their health, for animal health, and for their gut. Right. I mean, um, I, I agree. I Believe me, what, what diet do I tell people if they need to lose weight? I go get Chef AJ's book. <laughs> yeah, well, I say just kick them out of the practice. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Well, then it would make room for the people that are vegan that really need a, need a plant-based doctor like you. you. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're wonderful. Thank you so much for everything you do and doing the conferences and, and for oh, you know pleasure. going plant-based. I hope that, have you been able to influence any of your colleagues in in Maryland to, yes. to do what you did? Yes, so um, there's a, a Dr. Rosemary Olivo, who is an internal medicine doctor at Mercy Medical Center. And she and I started talking when, um, when, when I first found out about Esselstyn and I was getting my patients to buy his book, I um, sent a, a message to, to Esselstyn's uh, website asking, you know, do you have some way I can buy them wholesale, you know, for the patients? And, um, and he called me and said, oh, why don't you come out and you can um, apprentice my program. So he invited me out and, and my husband, Gary, went with me and we went and spent the day with him there. And so anyway, what, leading up to and doing that whole event, I was talking with this other doctor at the hospital and we were, um, uh, you know, and so she started getting really interested in it. Now she is 100% plant-based, works on it with her patients. And prior to COVID, we were actually in the process of working on getting the CHIP program to Mercy Medical Center. And because uh, there's also a, a plant-based dietitian at Mercy. And so the three of us were starting to work towards getting the CHIP program, but you know, that's on hold now. Well, that, keep trying, because that's fantastic. And how about your staff? Have any of them changed to plant-based since seeing yeah. your... Yes, the, um, yeah, one of them is almost completely plant-based and the other one has younger children and a husband that's not quite so cooperative. So um, she doesn't do it quite as much, but, um, but the, uh, yeah. One why, of do the these, why do these people stay with these people? I don't get it. <laughs> that's a whole nother show for Dr. Lyle to answer. Well, we have somebody watching live who's going to be on next Friday. Her name is Sharon McRae. You ever heard of her? <laughs> yeah, that, that's great how you guys hooked up. Yeah, that was, that was just worked out so well. Her daughter attended, I was speaking at a gifted and talented program when her daughter was in eighth grade at a gifted and talented at the same program. And she came up to me afterwards and said, my mother really wants to meet you um, because she's plant-based. So Sharon and I connected and it was one of those, I'm sure you've all had this experience. She came over, we sat down at the, at the kitchen table and like three hours later, we like, oh, <laughs> where did the time go? You know, we're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so we started early on doing small programs. We started off with like little programs, like 30 people like that. And then eventually grew into these large programs that we do. Well, I think you guys are, are like chocolate and peanut butter better together because you're so calm and it's perfect balance to Sharon who's like wired <laughs> like me, you know? So you guys are great together. Sharon said it was meant to be. We say that's for Sharon. Before I let you go, I have to ring the bell because somebody named Kit gave me a Berkey water filter. Sometimes people, you know, make little donations for me doing this show. And she said, what do you want? And I said, I want a Berkey water filter. And she got me one. So if you're watching Kit, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you, Dr. Simpler, for being a voice of reason oh, and calm and, and, and for are, doing- You are the best. I mean, this is just incredible what you've done with putting this program, putting these programming on every week and taking the time to track the people down and get everything lined up. I mean, what a service you have done this year. It was really, really a gift from your heart, a gift to all of us. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. And I appreciate all of you watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow. We have an unbelievable cooking demo with Christina from Joy Foods. Thanks so much. It's just, if this is what I have to do to talk to people like you for an hour, this is my pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Simpler. Pleasure's mine.